Heavenly Father, as we come into your word, give us insight through your spirit and through the living word that we might be a changed people. Anoint the preaching of your word and the individual interest in our own lives for you, that our desires will be for you and for you alone. We pray for a wonderful ease and fellowshipping with you and with one another, knowing that all is well, for you're in control. Bless us, your people. We ask this in your blessed name with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Well, in the last few weeks, we've been talking about um, the appearance uh, of Jesus Christ, resurrection appearances. And on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, he appeared five times on that same day. Right? It's wonderful. He appeared to the women at the grave, and then he appeared to um, the two men who were working on the, uh, walking on the road to Emmaus. And uh, then he appeared to his disciples. And this is recorded uh, in Luke 24. There are three of the five accounts of Jesus' appearance on that particular day. Now, why is the resurrection so important? Well, it's important because it assures us that Christ is alive. We have a living God. We have a God that is alive, and He knows us, and He loves us, and He's taken the initiative for God so loved the world. And so we thank God that the assurance that we have that He is indeed alive, and He shows Himself numerous times. And there are 13 records of Him being seen by others. So we know that God's mighty work, uh, mighty power, is at work. It is destroying the power of sin because he has already died on the cross and he has declared us just before him. By his stripes we are healed and that his death has paid the penalty. We are a redeemed people. Redemption comes to the idea of buying a slave from a master and then having a new master and setting that slave free in order to serve. So Jesus has bought us and we are bought by his blood. There was no other way. And so the resurrection is God's mighty power in us. When we think of an aeroplane, it is uh, made of rubber and iron and steel and all kinds of things. There's no way this thing's going to fly. I mean, gravity pulls this down. And then they fill it up with a whole bunch of uh, diesel and, uh, and then it flies off. Why does it stay in the air? Because of jet power. Jet power propulsion overcomes the gravity. It's the power of God, the resurrection power, that overcomes the pull in the law of sin and death. And so when the jet stays up in the air, it is impossible. It weighs so much. But there is a power that overcomes the law of sin and death. And that is the same with Christ. His resurrection power works in us. It destroys sin in us. It creates new life and it prepares us for his return. Secondly, the resurrection is so important and we know that death has been conquered. The grave is empty. Jesus has shown himself. And so we too will be raised from death to life forevermore. He promises that. And his whole teaching had to do with the fact that death could not hold us back. That there was life beyond this life. And that he, we would be with him and the Father. Thirdly, the resurrection helps us find meaning even in great tragedy. The two men who were walking on the road to Emmaus, they were uh, confused and perplexed. And they said, this, uh, this Jesus of Nazareth, we were hoping that he would redeem us. He would redeem Israel. He would um, get rid of the occupational forces of the Roman Empire. And that we would then have our own kingdom. And so they were disappointed. And their own people betrayed them. And there was a time we talked about that, that there's a crisis of our faith. Even Billy Graham had a crisis of his faith where he was at that one point early in his ministry where the, he had struggled with the inspiration of the scriptures, where it was really true. And we have to go through those battles. There are some doubts that we need to work through. But even in tragedy, when there is a death and there was darkness in the environment and it would appear that, that Satan had won, that God brings goodness out of evil. He's still in control. And that was his plan that Jesus died for us. We read in Isaiah 53 that it was God's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. And as we seek God's will in our lives, it doesn't always make sense. 
because God sees the bigger picture. I'm reminded when I drive in my car and I have the headlights go forward, I can only see the cor- to the corner, to the corner. I cannot see around. But God is above us and God watches over us and he can see what's coming the other way. And he can guide us, slow us down or pace so that we would not have an accident at that corner. God is indeed in charge of the tiniest little thing. Little Emanuela, God formed her in the womb of her mom. And he makes everything perfect. And so no matter what happens to us as we walk with the Lord, we know that the resurrection gives us hope. Because there is a God who is sovereign and above all things. And so in our faith, yes, we have evidence, but true faith is obeying what he tells us to do in spite of consequences. And so this morning, I just wanted to briefly go through some, an outline of these verses. We want to talk about the great surprise. And then there will be the great assurance where Jesus himself appears to his disciples. There is a great promise and an important and great question that we need to ask ourselves. First of all, the great surprise. Well, they were still talking about this. Who are they? Well, they're the two men or the two women, or not two women, two individuals, two followers of Jesus. It could be a husband and wife. Uh, traditionally, people have said it was two males, but it, it is not clear. It is a gender neutral as to who they, they would be. But they were followers. And we don't know. Uh, they were, may have been part of the 70 disciples that Jesus had sent out earlier. But they were talking about the events of the day. And while they were still talking, they had now, we find them in Jerusalem. We find them with the 11 and others who had assembled there that night. And the others were uh, talking about the events of the day. And I'm sure Mary Magdalene was there and some of the other women. And they had discussed, they had gone to the tomb. And the tomb was empty, that they saw angels. And that uh, Mary Magdalene had seen Jesus. And But in verse 34, it, we also see here... And saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. So all of a sudden, we see here just a little note saying he appeared to Peter. He appeared to Peter before he met the eleven that evening. So they're in the room and discussing. Jesus was already confirmed that others had seen him. Peter had seen him. It's appropriate for him as the leader to be the first man to see Jesus. He appeared to other women the first man and his associates. And so while they were still talking about this, discussing it all, and Jesus himself shows up. That's the great surprise. He shows up. God shows up and he is amongst us. He watches over us. And the first thing he says is that he gives him words of comfort. Peace be with you. Are you at peace right now with the things in your life? Or are you struggling? What's the weather like inside? Is it sunny and smooth sailing, calm waters, or is there a storm going on? Is there a restlessness going on? Is there a darkness? Where are you in terms of your inner life? And so they were anxious and they were fearful. And in verse 37, it says they were startled. He suddenly showed up. He didn't come knocking on the door. They didn't open the door. He himself showed up. He wasn't an angel. But they thought he was a ghost, and they were frightened, and they thought they saw a ghost. Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in ghosts? What are ghosts? Well, some people say that they are the spirits of departed people that are still hanging around. God, when God created the heavens and the earth, he made spiritual beings He made spiritual beings, angels, who would then rule and govern the heavens. And some of them rebelled against God, and Lucifer led them out, and they were fallen angels. They're still spirit beings, but they're unclean beings. They are evil spirits. They're demonic. They're devils. And so they are spiritual beings, those that are good angels of God who obey and minister to us according to his purpose, but they're evil spirits that live as well. So these ghosts can be evil spirits. These ghosts uh, ghosts, um, can be um, evil spirits, unclean spirits, because they've been around for a long time. And the word ghost and the word spirit is the same. 
People who say that the ghosts are spirits of departed people because we have a body, soul, and spirit, that they're restless, that they haven't gone where they're supposed to go, and they're caught in between, they say these are human beings. But the Bible doesn't say that. Because the Bible tells us that after it is appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment. So when we are with the Lord, to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord. So the Bible does not teach that the fact that the human being, when they, upon death, that their spirits linger around and that they are ghosts. That is not the Bible teaching. So the Bible teaches there's no ghosts. There's no phantoms. There is no spirits. So when you go to a seance or you see some kind of an image, you see somebody, your ancient uh, person, somebody you know who has now died, I believe the scripture it gives us indication that these are evil spirits that take on that appearance in order to make us afraid. And so ghosts don't exist. They are spirit beings who take on the appearance of other things. But we are frightened by these ghosts. So they thought they were, he was a ghost. It's not the first time they thought that he was a ghost because the last time they saw him walking on water and they thought he was a ghost. And so it's natural for us to kind of assume this. And the Jewish people assume that, that their spirits were still around. And, uh, and so I had an experience once where at nighttime I was sleeping and all of a sudden I heard this noise. And I waited and it didn't happen again. And then I waited and then happened like two or three in the morning. Happened a couple of times, and then I was scared. I said, praise Lord, you know, um, protect me from all evil, and started to pray, and I was anxious. My, my, my heart was going fast, and I was uncertain what the answer was. And so then I thought, I just keep my eyes open. It's happened two or three times. Then again, it happened again. <laughs> but this time I saw a little bat go across my room little brown bed. So I folded it into the living room and it ended up on the brick uh, fireplace and so I got my butterfly net out and I caught the bat. It was a little brown bat and I was ready to let it go when the little thought came to me is in the morning when you tell Claire this story she's not going to believe you. <laughs> so then what I did was I kept the little brown bat, put it in a glass, put some holes in it and put it on the shelf in the garage. So in the morning, when she came for breakfast, I said, hi, Claire, did you have a good sleep? Yeah, I had a great sleep. I said, I saved your life last night. What do you mean you saved my life? Well, there was a bat flying around, and, and man, it was going back and forth, and I finally caught it. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, sure. You know, and uh, so I said, no, I got it. I got it on a shelf in the garage. No way. So then I brought the evidence, and that was it. So what did Jesus do when he, said, when he was arrived? They said they thought he was a ghost. They were paralyzed. They didn't even know what to say, but God knew they were thinking, this is a ghost. This is not real. In the middle of the night when we're sleepy and our eyes haven't been adjusted and we're still groggy, we can see all kinds of things. I remember another time my brother and I were, uh, were at my, uh, my dad's place and and what happened is they weren't there, but at uh, 4.30, quarter to 5 in the morning, there was this noise, rawr, rawr, all these wild animal noises that was so frightening, curl, you know, curled my back and one morning, and I said to my brother, Mike, did you hear that? He goes, no, I was asleep. Okay, well, then the next morning it happened again. On the third day, we decided we were going to go out with our 22 to see what's going on because that property had 25 acres. And so we walked through the bush. And what do you know? It was exactly the same time when that occurred, all that noise occurred. And Eric knows the answer. The farmer behind us was feeding his animals at that time in the morning. So it was all the animals in the barn. They were making so much noise. But I had no idea what it was. So I was scared. So we can be afraid. And you know what Jesus does? He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, you guys, what's the matter with you? Peter, why did you deny me? 
Why did you all run away from me when I was in the garden? He doesn't do that. But he asks very gently, he says, why are you doubting? Why are you troubled? You know me better than that. I've been with you long enough. And then he shows himself his hands and his feet. So here's the evidence. It's really me. I think the two that were on the road to Emmaus and they invited Jesus to stay overnight with them, they recognized him when he broke the bread. And I don't know uh, how he distributed the bread, but it says the scripture says that God opened up their eyes, but I think the nail prints in his hands were part of what they saw. And they fellowshiped around that. And so he showed him his hands and his feet. And he says, it is I myself. It's truly me. I'm here. I'm right here. We can see ourselves back in Genesis where, where um, Jacob uh, was lied to, that his son Joseph was killed by an animal, and that he was, in, uh, he was gone. And uh, Joseph, uh, Jacob was so upset that he'd never see his son anymore. But then when he was told that his son is still alive some 20, 22 years later, and, and he's the prime minister of Egypt, I'm sure he felt the same way. He was paralyzed with, ah, oh, is it really true? I can't believe it. And so the disciples were like this. It is I myself, touch me. The invitation to look at his hands and his feet, an invitation to touch him and see. Is it really me? Because a ghost does not have flesh and bones. And so, interesting, this glorified body, this resurrected body, has flesh and bones. Now, how does this glorified body go through the walls? Show up, appear and disappear. Flesh and bones don't appear and disappear. It's Jesus, the risen Lord. And how is he able to eat? He asks them, he says, for food. To, um, to give even more evidence, because in verse 40, after he had said this, he showed him his hands and feet, but they were still not believing, because they were so full of joy in seeing him. They were overwhelmed and amazed that he was really there, but they, they couldn't grasp. And then he goes further, and he says, do you have anything to eat? Because the ghost can't eat. The ghost doesn't eat. But a glorified body is able to eat. A glorified body doesn't eat because of nutritional reasons. And then we ask ourselves, when we get to heaven, are we going to be able to eat food? Well, a glorified body, Jesus was able to eat food. We won't be able to eat food for a nutritional basis, but we will eat food for the sake of pleasure. We will enjoy all the goodness of the Lord. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish. So this is the great assurance. He showed them himself. He invited them to touch and see his hands, his feet. He invited them to touch him. He, still not believing, he invited them to give him something to eat. And in verse 43, it says, he took it and he ate it in their presence. So they could testify to the fact that I was there when he showed up and we were able to touch him. We heard him. He spoke to us. We saw him, we touched him, and you know what? He even ate some fish. So he's not a ghost. Jesus is not a figment of our imagination. The risen Christ is a physical resurrection, but with a glorified body. A resurrection no longer to die. Not resuscitation, but a resurrection. And so we have the great assurance. We also now have the great promise. And what is this promise? Well, in John 5, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son of Man gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. The promise of eternal life, whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. We are reminded in, in uh, Daniel chapter 12, in verse 2, it says that multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Some will awake to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. And so in Daniel chapter 12, some 600 years before, 
God has promised in his word that there will be a resurrection of the wicked and the resurrection of the righteous. The ungodly, the wicked, will be raised to life in order to be condemned and judged, and they will go into the lake of fire. It will be at the great white throne judgment at the end of a thousand years, millennial years. And they are literal years, because in the chapter in Revelation, in chapter 20, 1,000 years occur six times. So it's not uh, a metaphor. A thousand years is a thousand years. On the third day he rose, it's it's the third day. He created the earth in six days. Six days. 24 hours. We need to take God's word literally. And so some will raise to judgment. Some will be given eternal life. And that is why Job was able to say that in the end he will stand. I know my Redeemer liveth. And I will see him with my own eyes. Jesus has gone into heaven, and he will come again. He said, truly, truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word, in verse 28, our next slide, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. We must believe, and to believe we must hear. How can people believe if they don't hear? They need to know. And this development of faith to the position to the uh, position of accepting Him as saving, as Savior and Lord takes time. We need to dispel some of the doubts. It's like a farmer trying to cultivate his field. He's going to get rid of the stones first before he puts in the good the good seed. And there are doubts in people's lives as long as they have good questions and they're willing to know the answers. And so there is eternal life, those who believe in him. It's not a philosophy of life. It is not a mantra for living. It is not just being good and trying to get yourself into heaven. It's believing in him. It's a relationship. The scriptures remind us that there will be people uh, at heaven's door who will then knock and knock and say, Lord, Lord, let us in. And he will say, I don't know you. That's relationship. I have to challenge you this morning. Do you know Christ as personal Lord and Savior? You might know about him, but do you know him? Is that intimate fellowship that you have with him, that he is in you and you are in him, and at the death's door, you will be with him in glory? For your name is written in the book of life. This is the great promise that if we put our faith in him, He will be faithful and true to forgive us of all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the great promise is life eternal. What's the great question? Well, the great question is when Jesus comes back, are you going back with him? That event is the rapture. That event is in John 14. And Jesus, as he speaks to his disciples, he said to them, Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, much room. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Where is Jesus now? He's in heaven preparing a place for you and I. And he's coming back. And when he comes back, are you going with him? Or will you be left behind? Because there's more to life than just here. The Jewish belief in death was that when a person lived their biological life, and upon death, they would then descend to a place called Sheol, which is a place of the dead, where they will then um, rest forever, without end, continuous sleep, and continuous silence. And the only legacy in the Jewish faith was the only legacy was the perpetual uh, perpetual eternal life or eternal existence of a nation Israel and the legacy of a good name. So if you listen to a Jewish person give tribute to someone who has died, a Jewish person, they will say, may their good name live forever. It's the legacy of their name. No, no, we have a legacy of eternal life. And this life is in his son. And so the moment we take our last breath is the moment that we are with him in glory. There is no middle place. 
There are some who believe in a doctrine, a place called purgatory. It's nowhere in the Bible. As soon as we die, it is appointed unto men once to die and then the judgment. And so non-believers will be in a holding place called the place of torment, Sheol, the grave. And later on at the great white throne judgment, they will be judged. They will race to life to judge and they will be then sent to the lake of fire forever. The righteous who are in Christ will be given eternal life. There are the haves and the have-nots. He who has the Son has life. Who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's black and white. And so, where are you at? Are you on God's side? Has Jesus saved your soul? If you haven't, then you need to invite him to be your Savior. How do we do that? Well, first of all, there are four words. There is sin and death, Christ and faith. Sin, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And because of our sin, the wages of sin is death. Death means eternal separation. Death means separation of a relationship. Forever separated. So the ungodly will be forever separated from God. The good, that's the bad news, sin and death. The good news is that Christ. Christ is the way. He's the way to the Father. He's the way of truth. He is the truth personified. We need to believe in him. That is Christ. He made the difference. He took the initiative. He not only died on the cross, but he was raised from the dead. And so the death of the Lord and the risen, his resurrection are all the same, one of the same. Without this, we have no life. Our faith is useless and our preaching is useless and there's nothing more. We have no hope. And so we have Christ, but Christ is also a historical figure. Many people believe that Jesus was a historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth, that he was, uh, died and he was put on a Roman cross. They know that historically, but it's not a saving knowledge. You have to ask him to be your savior. And he doesn't push himself in. He knocks at the door. We're reminded in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone opens the door, I will come in and sub with him. I will come in and have fellowship with him. There's a famous picture of Jesus knocking on the door, and you may recognize and you might remember that there's no doorknob on the outside of that door. Because Jesus is knocking on that door, he wants you to open that door from the inside. Because he's given you free will. Will you open up your heart and ask him to be your savior? You must today, for you may not see the sunrise with your physical eyes tomorrow morning. The end is near. The end is near. Make the right decision. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent Jesus to be our Redeemer, that he paid the penalty of his own life. The blood was shed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We are a forgiven and redeemed people, but not everyone is going to take that option. No, but everyone is going to choose Christ. We pray for those that haven't made that decision yet. We pray that their hearts will be moved by your Holy Spirit. For the urgency is great. The end is near. You're coming back to take your own unto yourself. And we pray that our loved ones and those we know in our circle of influence will not be left behind. Give us a burden for the lost and give us a passion for you to recognize that the things of this world will pass away. But the labor that is done for the Lord and in the name of the Lord is an investment in eternity. Move our hearts this day and bless your people. We are the people. You are the great shepherd, and we are the sheep of your fold. Lead us and guide us. Lord, we thank you for that glorious day when we will see you face to face. There are many of us who will welcome you with arms open and are so grateful for your mercy that has allowed us to be in your presence. There are others who will see you face to face, and they will bow their knees, even though they have not acknowledged you as Lord and Savior. Lord, we look forward to that moment face to face. Let us be true until we see you. Let us be faithful 
until we see you so that we are unashamed as you're coming. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our song face to face. The disciples were witness to the reality of the re resurrection, so must we. We must be witnesses that we have a living Savior, and he lives in the world today, and he lives in our hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, and the Lord be gracious unto you, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen.